Thank you. Okay. Um, as you may know, uh, for the last several years, the island has opted to take the funds that we would have used to offer to uh, a delegate gift and instead we make a donation to a local charity that's meaningful to our host firm. Here in Philadelphia, the chosen organization is the Alliance for Decision Education. To speak with us today is their executive director, Joseph Sweeney. I'd like to invite Joseph up. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Lindsay. And I'm gonna grab notes because as you can see from the pre-COVID picture, it's been a while since I've been in front of a group. <laughs> So apologies for the, uh, the out-of-date stuff there. And I have not been playing with uh, speaker notes in a long time, but this is really quite a treat. I do wanna say thank you to all of you, but also especially uh, thank you to David Gitlin and Barry Cohen uh, with Royer, Cooper, Cohen and Braunfeld for suggesting the Alliance to the International Lawyers Network and making it possible for us to be here today. Thank you all for having me uh, and inviting me to share with you the mission, vision, and work of the Alliance. So there's a, let's see if this, oh, so great, worked. <laughs> Possibly more than most, and I know this because of so many family members who are attorneys, um, all of you like us at the Alliance for Decision Education know that decisions matter. Our decisions are how we live our lives and affect the world around us. They are the way that we express our values, alter our course in life, and ultimately determine who we are. What most of us are more recently coming to understand is that decision quality is mutable. Each of us can learn to be better decision makers. Four decades of interdisciplinary research in various sciences have shown this to be true. And across so many industries, companies are training their leaders and managers on the skills and dispositions to improve their judgment and decision making. And with amazing results. The Alliance is focused on building a movement to have these skills shared with the most cherished and hopeful members of our society, our children, students. So our mission is to improve lives by empowering students with essential decision skills. And our vision is to ensure that decision education is part of every student's learning experience. Oh, that's a nice slide. Beautiful. We were founded in 2014. Uh, by two leaders who saw the enormous benefits of including decision-making skills in their work and joined forces to bring these skills to students who are tomorrow's parents, community members, employees, and leaders. Probably quite a few of you will know Eric Brooks. Eric was one of the uh, founders of Susquehanna International Group, the largest options trading uh, company in the market. Um, and Eric found that by building a culture around decision-making skill and focusing on that, as opposed to the traditional way of focusing on what um, options people were trading in or what markets or verticals they were trading in, they could, um, well, they could create an enormous competitive advantage. The thing that he was surprised to find was that the traders would come and their family members would come to him and say, these decision skills that you're training your employees on, they're affecting the quality of our life, the quality of our marriages, the quality of our parenting, the quality of the way that we engage with thoughts about our philanthropy or our civic engagement. Um, and the more that Eric heard about that, the more committed he came to the idea that this is something that should be taught to everyone, to all students. Annie Duke, who's our co-founder and is now married to Eric, <clears throat> you probably, more of you probably know, she's quite famous as a, a speaker and best-selling author and world poker champion. If you don't know Annie herself, you probably know her books. Uh, I imagine some of you have read Thinking in Bets. Maybe, no? If you haven't, I strongly recommend that one. Uh, How to Decide, which is excellent. And there's a new one coming out, which I just got to look at the manuscript for, which I'm excited, uh, called Quit, The Power of Knowing When to Walk Away. Annie's talent and passion for communicating the science of decision-making to the public, in my mind, is just unmatched. So we started small. Uh, we focused on um, working with teachers and students in the largest city in the United States with the highest poverty level, which unfortunately is Philadelphia. And our idea was to bring these skills and dispositions to students there because they had the least slack in their life. They had the least social capital and economic capital for recovering from bad decisions. 
So that's where we started. But Eric and I actually met when I was working at the Haverford School, which is a local preparatory school. And it's almost the exact opposite on the spectrum as far as resources go and um, the involvement of uh, parents in the teaching of decision-making. What I saw there was an entire school that was transformed by bringing decision-making into the culture. It was a shared lexicon. Everyone knew what it meant to structure a decision, how to think about their values and generate alternatives and think through consequences, even drawing decision trees. To see a junior in high school drawing out a decision tree or a senior thinking about their major or their college they're going to go to and to have their parents being communicated with in the school in the same way, the coaches, teachers, guidance counselors are all talking about decision-making in a consistent way. It became infused and part of the way the boys thought, it was a boys school, thought about doing this. So at the time I was, uh, I was working at the Haverford School, they asked me to be on the advisory council when we started up and our focus was those students in the public schools in Philadelphia. So that's where the, the charity got started. But we've been growing a lot since then. We got started in 2014, we ran a number of experiments uh, around how best to impact the dispositions and skills that we were able to discern were important to people's decision-making quality. As we learned and as we saw what was possible, our ambition grew. And so we, we repositioned ourselves about four years ago as uh, a movement builder, a field builder. The idea being that it's not enough in the United School district, school systems in the world are all very different. The United States, for those who aren't familiar, has a heterogeneous school system. Uh, so we Just in Pennsylvania alone, there are 530 school districts. Each of them makes their own determinations about curriculum and content and to some degree standards. Uh, there are very few things we agree all students need to know and be able to do by the time they graduate. Trying to affect change in that system is a particularly difficult problem. So when we looked at how to go about changing it, what we decided to do was to build a field called decision education and to build a national movement to call for it. So on the one side, we're creating examples with teachers of how this looks in the classroom. What are the pilots, the resources, the professional development, uh, the curricula that they need? What are the assessments that are helpful for benchmarking where a student is on these skills and dispositions? But on the other side, we needed to build demand. We actually needed to form a market, if you will, for decision education in the United States. And that means changing public perception about the fact that decision-making is something you can get better at, that there are real skills and dispositions you can improve, that it's teachable and learnable, and that it should be something that schools attend to. So one of the first steps, this won't surprise anyone in this room, if you wanna start making big claims like that, you better come with some credibility. And a little tiny charity in Philadelphia who's only worked with a few public schools doesn't have that kind of gravitas, even when you've got co-founders as uh, eminent as Eric and Annie. So we started building an advisory council and board to match the mission. So we went and found some Nobel laureates like Daniel Kahneman, just by a show of hands, because I'm curious, uh, how many people know who Daniel Kahneman is? Oh, just a few, okay. So Danny won, he's the first psychologist ever to win a Nobel prize for economics. And it's because he studied human decision-making and he found that the way that economics was treating decision-making was still using the concept of the rational actor, that we behave rationally when it comes to our utility, that we will always do the things that makes us better off in the future. We don't, we discount heavily on the future. We get anchored on things. Our context changes our decision-making in ways that it should not. There's a lot of noise in our decisions. It's actually his newest book, Noise, if you haven't read it, uh, a lot of it's about uh, judicial decisions and uh, the the variation in those decisions that are unrelated to, <laughs> Lisa's already telling me, hey, Joe, you're done. Uh, I would strongly recommend that this group read Noise. It's fantastic. And uh, so Danny won a Nobel Prize for that work around our decision-making. Richard Thaler might be more familiar than he wrote Nudge. If you haven't read that, it's all about how we can change the choice architecture around someone. Marketing firms are using this constantly. They're weaponizing all of this. <clears throat> but what we wanna do is arm the next generation with the skills to make decisions for themselves and not be manipulated by this quite so much. I'm gonna move more quickly just because I'm conscious of your time and I know the uh, interesting case that you're gonna be presented with next. Here's some other folks who have joined the advisory council recently. Michael Mobison is probably more familiar. He's a, a more popular, uh, Phil Tetlock, who was the head of the super forecasters, um, the Good Judgment Project. They won the IARPA competition for improving forecasting and analysis for the intelligence agencies. Uh, 
Katie Milkman is a behavioral scientist. Some of you might know. Paul Slovic helps governments around the world with their nuclear decision and um, nuclear weapons policy decisions. We began to gather these leaders across industries and across the decision sciences. Just someone's recognized someone. There you go. Is it Gary or who? Okay. Yeah. I, uh, Gary's been a treat to work with. I did not expect to enjoy working with him quite as much as I have. Uh, it's really been a lot of fun. Um, Jan Tai, for those who don't know, is the first uh, woman in the American Navy to ever command a fleet. She was the head of cybersecurity, warfare, cyber warfare for the US Navy. She's declared this a national, um, oh, Christ, crisis isn't the right word, national priority, I think is how she phrased it, that we absolutely have to teach these skills to the next generation. Sure, well, this one doesn't have anything to help you with, Joe, so I'm just going to keep moving. One of the things that we've seen is that the environment for students is changing. So we've got 40 years of research showing us that decision making is important and is changeable. And we've also got a lot of research showing that the information environment, the decision making context for this next generation is harder than ever. Some of these studies are uh, pretty disconcerting, especially the one that's showing that high school students cannot tell, they literally cannot tell fact from fiction when reading a website. There's just not what we're teaching them to do in schools in the US at least. We're not showing them how to think critically. We're not teaching them how to think probabilistically. We're not teaching them to look for disconfirming information. They have an initial hypothesis or theory. They get anchored to it. They start arguing for their position. It's what they're being taught in our 24 hour news cycle. It's what they're being shown by way of influencers on Instagram, Snapchat, uh, Twitter, et cetera, et cetera. If you, just out of curiosity again, how many people here are parents? Okay, there we go. Now, now, now we're going to start being on the same page. So what are we trying to teach? These are skills and dispositions that are probably similar to things that you try to bring to your advising of your clients. When you're talking to your clients and you're trying to get them to think about a deal or a settlement, you're often talking in terms like expected value. Right? You're talking about the risks involved, the, the likelihoods of things. That's thinking probabilistically. That's one of the most important domains that we've seen to actually affect the quality of people's decision-making, especially for adults. What we're trying to do now is figure out how much, in what dosage, at what age is developmentally, is it appropriate to start getting students to think in terms of gray and maybe instead of black and white positionality, and then to start adding numeracy to that and say, to, to know what it feels like to be 75% confident about something versus 50-50. That doesn't sound like a big deal, but it dramatically changes the quality of decision-making if you can get people to start playing with that and to ask them, well, what information would move you to 90%? Or what information would move you down to 40%? What could you hear that would change your mind? That's all in that thinking probabilistically. Structuring decisions, this is pretty obvious for this group, but we're talking about there is actually going through some kind of checklist or step or cycle about your decision-making so that you take into account things like, am I framing the problem correctly? Am I generating enough alternatives and are they created enough and different enough and all of them are doable? Am I thinking about the information I could be or should be gathering? Am I thinking about trade-offs and consequences? That's all done in the structuring decisions part of the work. Valuing and applying rationality, it's, that's the term that's used in the psychological sciences and what we're starting to use with the educators. We're talking about there are two kinds of rationality, epistemic and instrumental. So epistemic rationality is how good is your map of the world? And what are you doing to update it? So are you seeing the world accurately? That's what epistemic rationality is. How am I knowing the world around me? And am I trying as a young person to become more of a truth seeker than winning an argument? Would I rather update my map or win and convince someone that my map is right even when it's wrong? So there are different times in life when you want those skills and you use them differently, but we wanna start emphasizing the value of updating your map, of updating your beliefs. Instrumental rationality is the second part of that. Is Am I behaving in ways that are consistent with my goals? If I say to you, mom, dad, my goal is to, uh, is to be on the track team and keep my grades up at at least you know, above a B, and I'm not doing things that are consistent with that, meaning I'm never practicing or I'm hanging out late the night before a track meet or whatever, be able to talk to students about instrumental rationality actually helps them develop some agency and realize, oh, these are my goals. These are things I'm saying I want to do and I'm not behaving in ways consistent with them. What we're finding is students actually can develop some pretty strong um, 
skills related to that. And the last one there is recognizing resisting cognitive biases. These are things that you've seen probably in the popular press, but they haven't made their way down to K-12 education. Some of them I've already mentioned. The biggest one's probably confirmation bias, right? The idea that once we have an opinion, we start selecting information that supports it and accepting that more easily than we do information that would change our minds. This is a makes a lot of sense from an evolutionary biology point of view, but it's not so useful for us today in our current environment. So those are the kinds of things that we're doing. I've mentioned some of the skills. Obviously happy to follow up with anybody who's curious about any of this, because what we need more than anything else are lots of interested and engaged professionals who are saying, yes, this stuff matters. I want this for my kids for the future. I'd like to have us watch a short uh, video, very short, of a few teachers that we work with talking about this. Before I do, I wanna just impress upon everyone's mind here, the utility of this. If you can imagine just a tiny improvement in the decision-making of everyone in our society, whether it, bless you, your clients, your spouses, your coworkers, your neighbor down the street, the people running for office, the people in charge of the healthcare system, the social justice system, uh, related to things around the environment, war and peace, whatever you care about, if you can imagine going into the hearts and minds of every person in this country or around the world and making them just 5% better as decision makers at forming judgments and making skillful decisions, the cumulative impact is enormous. The opportunity here is absurd. It doesn't take much across the whole of society, a small improvement before we start seeing some real change and real opportunity. So sometimes I pause and think about that and I get a little overwhelmed about uh, the enormity of what we're trying to do, but then remind myself that actually a little bit here uh, is, a, is a lot. So hopefully this little video will run. These are some educators we've been working with. I think it's good to hear from them. I have never seen such motivation and engagement. My students have shown growth in their academic understandings and skills. They were now part of the conversation. And for me, that was valuable. It really helped my students look at the various different options. There's just no way we lose training students to be critical viewers of the world in which they live. Decision education, it really helped my students look at the various different options. So they weren't fixated on perhaps one option like, oh yeah, I, I, I think we should do this because of this. It's like, well, let's consider these other alternatives that might also exist. And it really, you know, helped me think differently about how I teach things, teach content in the classroom. Uh, and that's been really beneficial for me and my students. They have access to so much information and they're used to instant gratification. A lot of times they'll Google and then they can start down a path and become captured in it and they don't necessarily take the time to fact check that this is information that is actually true. I saw this as an opportunity to help them develop life skills that aren't just useful in my classroom, but just in general, so that they know that what they do actually makes an impact. I found it brought kids from a really heightened level down to having reasonable, intelligent conversations and being able to resolve issues, they went from often polarized views and really stark black and white thoughts on issues to really coming into the middle and seeing so many perspectives on different current events that we would discuss that they weren't able to see before. I think a really important piece of the decision-making model is um, the identity piece and really Bringing your, you bring, we bring our identities to the decisions that we make. And I have found that working with 11 and 12 year olds, they don't understand necessarily that when they have a problem or an issue that they're discussing where a decision has to be made, that what really matters to them needs to be part of the solution. Because if it's not, it won't address the problem. In my experience as a teacher, there have been many instances where students have made life altering decisions and they didn't really understand the consequences of that. So I thought it would be great to provide students with that space in the classroom to begin becoming more intentional, right? So by the time that they are global leaders that are intentional, that are critical about the resources that they're given to them so they're able to make 
you know, hopefully great and informed decisions. I know that decision making, again, is something we're going to do our whole lives. We equip kids to read as early as we possibly can so they can be readers. We equip them to do math as soon as we possibly can so that they can be numerate. So why wouldn't we equip them to make the best possible decisions or at least be able to evaluate what decision making is? I didn't know this existed 12 years ago. It didn't really, the sciences did, but the idea that this could be brought to K-12 students across our country and could become part of what every young person learns, that they learn to uh, try to see the world more accurately, to think about their values, what they actually want for themselves and those they care about, to try to take on someone else's point of view and think what information must they be operating with and um, what biases might be affecting my thinking on this. It, you can just think about whether it's COVID or the recent things that have gone on in our politics or things closer to home, the impact this could have. I've worked personally with, I think it's thousands now, of teenagers. It's been an unbelievable gift uh, after leaving the technology industry and moving into education. Um, and student after student, young person after young person, you can see them become their better self when they start to appreciate that decisions are what they are responsible for, that they're actually supposed to be the author or at least the co-author of their own life. So we're centering the education professionals in this. We're trying to make this be a movement about and from education, but we can't do it alone. It's not going to be the small organization in Philadelphia that pulls this off. It's going to take a movement of society. And I like to think about three kinds of people that we need help with. So in fairness to the organization, and especially our hosts, I'm mostly here today just to say thank you. ILN very generously supported us with a gift. You selected us as your local charity. We really do appreciate that. It's gonna help us with resourcing some of the work that we're doing around the country. But we also need three other kinds of help. Well, doers, donors, and door openers. <clears throat> Doers are obvious, that's volunteers. People wanna get involved directly and help with some aspect of the work. Donors is probably also very obvious. This is taking a lot of money to make happen. And what we're trying to do over time is secure funding from states and school districts and federal budget. But in the beginning of a thing like this, it comes from personal philanthropy and foundations. So if there's someone that you think, oh, uh, they'd like to support this, or even I'd like to support this, of course, we'd be very happy to take that phone call. The last one though is door openers. And here's where I think this organization could be particularly helpful. Our network is only as big as our personal Rolodexes sometimes. But when you start thinking about who do I know that might care about this or wanna do something about it, it could be that at some point you're talking to a policymaker or to an education leader or to a progressive educator or to the, someone who runs their local PTA. If in those conversations, you overhear them saying something like, you know, boy, decision-making, sure is a problem. Well, a connection to us would be very, very welcome. We'd love to find people who have an affinity for this. We're not trying to convince everyone that this is the charity they should work on. But what we would love is for anyone who thinks this is something that matters and I'd like to get involved, that they know that we exist and that we have ways for them to be helpful and to participate. So that's what we're doing. Thank you very much for your support. I really appreciate it. And thank you for all of the wonderful work that you do as legal professionals providing advice and decision-making support uh, to your clients around the world. Thanks very much. Thanks. Thanks so much. Um, and for anybody that would like to know more, uh, there is a direct link to the organization in your apps as part of the program information for that piece of the conference. Um, and now we'd like to 